It's Metacosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. We continue our physiology playlist. In the previous video, we have talked about isotonic, isometric contractions and the difference between fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers. Today, we'll talk about the factors that affect muscle contractions, such as the stimulus, length tension relationship, and load velocity relationship. And we have all kinds of cool stories. This is video number 55 in this magnificent playlist. Let's answer the question of the previous video. Medicosis is trying to lift three loads. One is light, one is heavy, one is in between. Which one is which according to this graph? And here are the answers. The light is C. If it's the lightest weight, it's going to be the easiest to lift and therefore my muscle will contract a lot and it will shorten a lot. B is in the middle and A is the heaviest. I could barely lift it. I could barely shorten my sarcomeres. Each muscle is made of fascicles. Each fascicle has muscle fibers. The muscle fibers are the muscle cells. Each muscle fiber is made of myofibril. You know there is to the story. Here's the question. Which part of the muscle obeys the all or none law? And the answer is, it is the muscle fiber because it's the muscle cell. What is the all or none law? It's either a zero or a one. If you give me threshold, I'll give you the maximum contraction. If you give me something below the threshold, I'll give you no contraction. There is nothing in between. The excitation contraction coupling was discussed before. Pause and review. The factors that affect skeletal muscle contraction are five. We talked about number one and number five before. Recall, for the slow twitch fibers, remember the ox. For the fast twitch fibers, remember the chicken. Your body has both types of fibers. Here's the comparison between the two types. Pause and review. Next, muscle fatigue. With prolonged contraction or strong contractions, your muscle will get tired. What does that mean? Decreased strength of contraction. Increased duration of contraction. It takes longer for me to contract. Relaxation becomes incomplete, leading to muscle contractures. Why does my muscle get tired? Lactic acid accumulation, muscle ATP, depletion, blood flow, interruption, and decreased neuromuscular junction transmission. Accumulation, depletion, interruption, transmission. Now it's time to talk about the stimulus, the strength of the stimulus and the frequency of the stimulus. All right, I used to give you a weak stimulus. Now I'll increase the strength. I'll give you a stronger, more robust stimulus. This will activate more muscle cells or more muscle fibers. We call this recruitment. And this will cause gradual increase in the whole muscle contraction because as you know, the whole muscle is made of gazillion fibers. Your biceps muscle, for example, has gazillion fibers. Each fiber has a different threshold. So when I give you a certain stimulus, some fibers will be excited, others will not. But when I give you the maximal stimulus that is above all of the thresholds of the individual muscle fibers, all of your muscle fibers will activate and contract. How about a supra maximal stimulus? Nope, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm either a zero or a one because I obey the all or none law. How about the frequency of the stimulation? Let's say I used to stimulate you like this. But now I stimulate you like this. Increased frequency. This will increase the force of contraction. Every time you stimulate the muscle, you're releasing calcium. When you increase the frequency of stimulation, you open more calcium channels, you release more calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, causing more binding of myosin and actin together. The staircase phenomenon, like we are going upstairs. Give me a single stimulus, I'll give you a single twitch. One stimulus, one twitch. And we relax in between. Contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation. Give me many stimulus, so this is increased frequency. Contraction, I was going to relax, but then another stimulus came. So I contract again, I contract again. This is called unfused or incomplete tetanus or clonus. When you increase the frequency even more like crazy, the muscle will contract. I want to relax. I'm sorry, there is no way to relax. There's no time. Contract, 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 contract. This is fused or complete tetanus. When you go from here to here, you're increasing your intracellular calcium because you have opened the door to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In medicine, when you hear the word tetanus, ask yourself, are they talking about the tetanus of physiology, the physiological phenomenon? Or are they talking about tetanus, the disease, which is called by Clostridium tetany? Why did we call it tetanus or Clostridium tetany? Because it leads to continuous muscle contraction without relaxation until you die.
Now it's time to talk about the length tension relationship. Let me ask you a question. Which position will help you throw this arrow further? Position A where there is almost no stretch, position B where you have optimal stretch, or position C where you have insane stretch to the point of you're about to break the freaking bow. What's the answer? The answer is B, because it's an optimal amount of stretch. Below which, not good. Above which, not good. So if you want to draw a curve, it's going to look like this. It's going to go like this, within limits, and then you go here. Here, no, not enough stretch. B is the optimal stretch. C is beyond the tipping point. In economics, we call this the law of diminishing marginal return. Let's say you opened a pizza restaurant. Hiring the first employee might make sense because it's going to make you more productive. Hiring 100 employees in the same small restaurant is going to lead to decreased productivity. They are going to crack jokes together. They are going to get in the way of each other. Some of them will try to cheat by working less hard, etc. So there is a tipping point beyond which everything goes downhill. The law of diminishing marginal utility also applies to the preload of your heart. There is venous return, blood returning to your heart from the peripheral circulation. Okay, let's say that more blood return. Okay, all right. The heart is going to stretch more. <gasps> and then it's going to pump more. <laughs> more blood. <gasps> more stretch. Boom. More contraction. Within limits. If you increase the venous return like crazy, the heart is going to expand like this. To the point that actin and myosin are far away from each other. They cannot contract. And this will be detrimental to your heart and that's beyond the tipping point so here's the lovely graph length tension relationship more stretch stronger contraction more stretch stronger contraction more stretch stronger contraction more stretch stronger contraction until you reach the maximum beyond this tipping point more stretch oops the actin and myosin are far away from each other they can no longer slide over each other and this will decrease your force of contraction and here comes one of the most important laws in medicine, Frank Starling Law. If I ever have a son, I will call him Frank Hemoptysis. Go figure. And if I have a daughter, I will call her Bartonella. Such a beautiful name. Yeah, it is beautiful until you suffer from bacillary angiomatosis. Frank Starling Law. The greater the initial muscle stretch or length or preload, the greater the tension, the active tension that is. All right, ad infinitum, nope, within limits, beyond which you will start to deteriorate. Notice we said an isometric contraction. Why isometric? Because the length of the muscle is not changing. What is changing is the tension. Can you answer this question? Which scenario, A, B, or C, will help you th throw the arrow further? Is it A, B, or C? And the answer is, it is B, because at that position, you have the greatest amount or number of cross bridges between myosin and actin. But look at A, when there is no stretch, there is actually overlap of the actin, there is less cross bridges. On the other extreme, if you stretch it too far, now actin and myosin are no longer touching each other, it's very hard for your muscle to contract. Everything is good within limits, that's why B is the best. You want your actin fibers to be very close to each other to the point that the H zone disappears. Another question. In the Olympics, let's say you're trying to throw a spear. Which situation or which scenario will help you throw it further? Is it A, B, or C? In A, there is no stretch. In B, there is optimal stretch. In C, you're stretching your pectorals major like crazy to the point um, you're about to tear your freaking rotator cuff. Don't do this. So the optimal is here. At this point, H zone is almost disappearing and the actin and myosin are overlapping beautifully, giving you the greatest number of cross bridges between actin and myosin. Now we know how to compete in the Olympics. He who better understandeth muscle physiology wins. And here is even another question. Which scenario will yield the greatest muscle tension? In the first scenario, okay, in all of these scenarios, imagine this is like a muscle outside of your body. Here is the muscle. Here's a string or a rubber band, and here's the load. In case one, you have a small load. Case two, a bigger load. Case three, same load weight as case two. However, I'm stimulating your muscle electrically using an electrical stimulus. That is threshold. Case number four, there is no load whatsoever. Now, can you answer the question? 
Sure. The best is case three. Why? Two reasons. First, the load is the heaviest, exerting the greatest tension on the string. And second, when you stimulate the muscle with an electrical stimulation, you will force a contraction, which means sliding of actin on the myosin. And this is the only scenario where you have the two factors, the stretch and the actin myosin contraction. You know the difference between two and three is that two is passive tension. Three is active tension because there is an actin myosin contraction. By the way, do you know what's going to happen to case number four? The muscle is not going to contract at all. You know why? Because there is zero load. People might imagine, oh, if you actually give me zero load, I will contract like it's nobody's business. No, you will never contract because there is no load. Why would your heart contract if there is no blood to pump? Duh! And this is the difference between passive tension and active tension. Passive tension give me a heavier load on a dead muscle. Okay, the tension is going to increase ad infinitum. I love this word. It makes me sound smarter than I am. And this is going to increase to oblivion like this, to infinity and beyond. However, the active tension, since we're talking about flesh and blood, actin and myosin, is within limit. Because when you stretch it too far, actin and myosin will not overlap whatsoever. There is no way that myosin will pull the actin because it cannot reach it, so you'll start going downhill. Now it's time to talk about the load-velocity relationship. Do you remember the question of the last video? Yeah, all right, what did we deduce? The lesser the weight of the load, C, the greater the shortening of the muscle fiber. Sure, C was the lightest, it was the easiest to carry, okay? Which means there is an inverse relationship between distance shortened and the weight of the load. If you give me a light load, light means the weight is low, the distance shortened will be great, which means my muscle will contract tremendously. Conversely, if you give me a very heavy load, my muscle will not shorten too much because it's too heavy. This can work for the distance shortened or the velocity of shortening of the muscle fiber. You can do it with distance or velocity. It's like the difference between a 1975 Toyota Corolla and a brand new Tesla. Tesla can cover a longer distance. Tesla has a higher velocity. Just remember the relationship is inverse. And when the relationship is inverse, the graph will look like this. Not like this. Nope, nope, nope. Like this. As the weight of the load increases, the velocity of shortening decreases. Don't believe me? Let's play the game. Let's see here. At a very light weight, if you go up here, that's your contraction. That's a very robust contraction. But if you give me a very heavy weight, look at this. That's your contraction. Dismal. The maximum velocity is called Vmax. Is Vmax real? Nope. It's just theoretical. It does not exist in reality. Because if the load weight is zero, your muscle will not contract and will not shorten. Why would your heart contract if there is no blood to pump? Duh! Since the relationship is inverse, you can argue that when you increase the afterload on the heart, the afterload is the arterial pressure. A with the A. After arterial. That's a load, right? Sure, when you increase the load, what's going to happen to the velocity? It's going to decrease. So the velocity and the distance of cardiac muscle shortening is going to decrease. Conversely, if you decrease the afterload, so the load goes down, what's going to happen to the velocity? It's going to increase. And that's why if medicosis gets hit by a car and starts to bleed and lose lots of blood and develop hypotension, what will be my heart rate? Very fast. Hypotension is associated with tachycardia. You know why? Because when you have low blood pressure, the afterload will decrease because there is less blood. This will increase the velocity and the distance of cardiac muscle contraction. That's why you have tachycardia. So why do we have tachycardia in cases of hypotension? Number one, it's because of the load velocity relationship. Number two is the baroreceptor reflex. When you lose blood, you will lose blood pressure. Blood pressure goes down, sending signals to the aortic arch and carotid sinus baroreceptor. They will send signals to the brain. They will tell the brain, hey, doofus, we're losing blood. Can you do something? Sure, let me send my fight-flight system, the sympathetic efferent, to release norepinephrine, increase heart rate, increase contractility, vasoconstrict the arterial. That's why you get tachycardia secondary to hypotension. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Question of the day. Which one is easier? The snatch weightlifting 
or the clean and jerk weightlifting. Please use your search engine to watch videos about the difference between the snatch technique and the clean and jerk technique for weightlifting in the Olympics. Let's say that this dude is medicosis. Is it easier for medicosis to lift weights using the snatch or the clean and jerk technique? Put differently, let's say that I will do both. In one instance, my record will be 200 kilograms. In the other instance, my record will be 220. I'll be able to lift heavier. Now the question is, which is which? Is 200 the snatch or is 200 the clean jerk and vice versa? Let me know the answer in the comment section. You'll find the answer in the next video. Pause and review. Let's review skeletal muscle contraction from Picmonic. Who is the hero of contraction? Calcium. Here is the cow. In order for myosin to bind actin, you gotta expose the active site. Is muscle contraction active or passive active? You need ATP from the mitochondria. And then you need ATPase activity to break the ATP into ADP and P. The head of the myosin is gonna grab the active site of the actin and pull the actin towards the midline. If you wanna learn more about hypertension and the medications used to manage hypertension, also the anti-hyperlipidemics, anti-arrhythmics, anti-anginal diuretics, digoxin, check out my cardiac pharmacology course and my website medicosisperfectionalis.com. I also have a CNS pharmacology course on my website. They come with videos, notes, cases, and a mind map. Coming up next, we'll talk about the muscle metabolism, EMG, smooth muscles, and their calmodulin, myosin light chain kinase, etc. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Go to Picmonic for animated medical mnemonics. Thank you for watching. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.